Well, this obviously is not my studio, uh, and there's some really weird lighting going on, as you can see here in my setup to set up to record in this very unwell lit room, which it's a great room. Don't get me wrong. I really enjoyed it. But where am I? Well, I'm in Toronto, Canada. Well, technically I'm outside of Toronto, Canada, attending or have already attended the World of Commodore. You want to know what my trip looked like? Stay tuned and I'll talk about my very first World of Commodore trip 2023. And as with most stories, it begins with a long journey for me. Jamie over at Jamie's Hack Shack and I, we got into a car. We drove eight hours to get from central Indiana to Toronto or outside of Toronto, Mississauga, Canada. I probably did not say that right. To get to the Admiral Inn so that we could attend our very first World of Commodore. And it was a good trip, no problems. We had a great little lunch. We stopped at a little place called the Clam Digger. It was obvious that the Clam Digger is a local hangout, but the the food oh my goodness if you're driving through detroit and want to find a good little bar food kind of place but the italian sub i had was fabulous i know jamie enjoyed his meal too we went through customs into canada no problem everybody was friendly as they are in canada uh the person checking us in even uh checking us in do you check into a country or the person letting us into the country did his normal quizzing what are you here for those types of things but then give me some tips just a really nice guy just doing his best to welcome this american to canada which is my first trip back to canada since before covid welcome to canada So I got to the hotel, got checked in, decided to go for a run, and I thought about going on a, for a run on the outside, but not a good idea because uh, outside it was very, very cold, rainy, dreary. It was like that the whole weekend. And I really love the where we stayed because it is just a parking lot away from the venue hotel, so it was easy to walk back and forth. Much like I say, Jamie's just right down the road from my regular studio at home. He's much, he's like right down the hallway where uh, he's down there. Very very similar situation here. So after a bit of dinner, we uh, both went back to our rooms, both got some sleep. We got up. We didn't have to be up uh, until well, the show didn't start till 10 the next morning. We did get up at nine o'clock, had a little breakfast, leisurely coffee, talked about how we we're going to attack the day because World of Commodore is a little bit different than the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest. In that, I mean that it's very, very focused on Commodore. It's a much smaller venue. And as you'll see, there's not as many exhibits. Now, also keep in mind that I will be talking about the presentations, but most of them, if not all of them, will be available online from TPUG or the Toronto Pet Users Group, the sponsors and hosts for this wonderful conference. So you're definitely going to want to come back and watch those videos in their entirety so that you get all the nuance and all the pieces and all the presentation, and it's going to be much more informative than what I'm going to share. All right, so day one began by checking in uh, uh, at the desk, 20 bucks. And if you something happened and you couldn't show up, the $20 got you access to the Zoom link so that you could see all the presentations, which I really appreciated that. Something could have gone horribly wrong with weather. Somebody could be ill, we couldn't make it. But at least now we had Zoom access in to see the presentations. But it's really about the exhibit hall and the people you'll meet there. I wouldn't say do that exclusively. Try and get to the actual conference itself. So as I mentioned, I stopped in, got our badge, and the very first person I saw was David Bradley. If you're not familiar with David Bradley, check out his channel. I'll link to all of this, everybody, and all the things you need to down in the video description. So check that out. But David was the first one to announce the World of Commodore, presented by the Toronto Pet Users Group. Got a chance to meet him. He's a big pet guy. My goodness, he has pets out his ears, can fix them, uses them. He'll just, he'll live stream about any random thing he's doing with a pet, and it's a lot of fun to watch his stuff. While in line, we knew we were going to meet up with him, but we met up with Rudy over at Rudy's Retro Intel. And Rudy had a great device that he was sharing with the Carolina community. And that device was called the Pet Companion, which adds composite audio and video out from a pet. And it was made even better because Rudy was kind enough to give me one of his assembled boards. Now, what was funny about that was, is he gave Jamie an unassembled board and he gave me an assembled board. Now, why did he do that? All you got to do is watch my live streams and you'll know that the kits that I put together rarely work on the first occasion where Jamie on his side, you, you, usually they do. So thank you, Rudy, for being sensitive to my needs. No problem. And providing me with a prepared or assembled kit. And I look forward to throwing that on my Commodore pet. And I will be doing that. And I'll be sharing that with all of you. 
Now, one of the things I noticed as I was walking through the venue, and as I mentioned earlier, the venue is not nearly as large as Vintage Computer Festival Midwest. Basically, the exhibitor hall is a single room, which is about the size of a half of one of the two rooms, maybe a little bit larger, at Vintage Computer Festival Midwest. So after talking with Rudy, it became evident that we quickly needed to get to our first presentation, which was the welcome to the world of Commodore. And so we crammed into this little room and we were greeted with a pre-prepared video, welcome from, as it was teased, two stars from sci-fi. Now I told Jamie, I thought maybe it was gonna be Star Trek, Strange New World, since they film in Toronto and maybe somebody knew somebody. The Babylon Project was our last best hope for peace. And it turns out it was Claudia Christensen and Bruce Boxleitner giving us the welcome, but how cool is it to have two sci-fi stars from a show that is not only known for great sci-fi, but also known for its cutting edge special effects at the time, thanks to, of course, the Amiga. So after the welcome, I took a little bit of a break and we came back in and the very first person to present was Rudy from Rudy's Retro Intel. And again, he was sharing and demonstrating his new device, the Pet Companion. Interestingly enough, during that, Rudy tried something that I try not to do, which is he tried to do a giveaway, had a little contest, uh, asked some people some trivia questions, and it turned out to be not exactly as he expected. He was gonna give away one kit. Unfortunately, or fortunately for those in attendance, he gave away three kits. Now, one of the things I will say, the Pet Companion is something you purchase, but it is also, the proceeds go to a children's hospital charity. Hopefully, if you were one of the ones of three that got one of these, think about throwing Rudy a few bucks for his charity, okay? Even when he gave me mine, I wanted to give back a little bit. So we tried to, we worked something out with Jamie and got all that worked out because I didn't have Canadian dollars in the whole thing. And thank you for doing work for the Commodore Pet community while at the same time giving to your local children's hospital. That's very admirable. And not just because you were at the Admiral Inn. Aww. It was back to the exhibit hall after Rudy's presentation where I met Dr. Chris of Pi Amiga 4 fame and um, all things fixing Amiga, and it was so great to meet him. Hey, Chris, say hi. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> Something I didn't know, I probably should know, is he was a technician back in the day with Commodore. That's where he gets his cred from. I just recently became familiar with Chris's channel through my executive producer, Mislav, who said, hey, you got to check this guy out. He's doing some really cool things with Amiga. Now, I'm typically an 8-bit guy, but as, as you know, I had an Amiga, an Amiga 500, and it's fun to watch him fix those things. But it's, he's just a funny guy, great guy to meet. He was very gracious. Dr. Chris, it was good to meet you. I did make a visit to the free table, and I did get some things. But you know what? I'm not going to show you because I'm going to save that for a live stream. If you want to see what's in this bag, and this isn't all I got, but if you want to see what I got at World of Commodore, Hey, hit that like button down, down there, hit that subscribe button, hit that alert. And when I have, this light is really freaking me out, but I'm liking it. When I have my live stream, you'll be alerted to that. And then you can watch as I reveal live what I got at the World of Commodore 2023. Next presentation was by Greg over at C64 OS. Now I talked to Greg prior. As a matter of fact, I saw him the night before, the very first night when we snuck in and we kind of looked around to see how things were going. Greg was there and he immediately came up to me and said, hey, Steven, I know you. So he did the, an amazing presentation of C64 OS, the new features, the fast app switching. It was incredible. When this is online, make sure you check that out. But one of the things that happened during the pres his presentation was he called me out. As a matter of fact, I'm I'm not I wouldn't say I wasn't paying attention, but I had my uh, I was taking notes on my phone. I was down taking notes, and all the all of a sudden I heard is Stephen Combs here, and I went, uh oh, what I do now? And uh, it's it's Greg, and he's calling me out because he said, and and like Retro Combs, who basically what he said was in a very nice way, uh, he's not reading instructions. This is how you reveal graphics. It was kind of a funny moment. You had to be there, and I'm glad he felt comfortable pointing me out. I mean, that is kind of my thing. I, I make a buffoon out of myself during live streams, and I did, and he noticed that. And I did learn a little bit later that he was working with Leaf, who had a Mega 65 there. They did get C64 OS working on the Mega 65 with the version 5 core. So that's something I'm going to be looking at, and maybe I'll show you how to do that in a future video. So the next presentation for day one was the 8-Bit Magazine Index by Miles Skinner, who has a PhD in music theory, but is providing an amazing service 
to the Commodore community by providing a Commodore Magazine Index that indexes magazines such as Compute, Computes Gazette, Transactor, Run, The Torpid, Ahoy, Info64, Interface, any Commodore Magazine, he has created an index. It is pretty amazing the work that he's put into it. Full text search not there yet because that takes a lot of resources, a lot of money but it was good enough. I was able to find a lot of things I was looking for. So make sure you check that out. Now this next one was the highlight of the day for me. And this was the opportunity here. RJ Michael of Amiga fame, one of the very first developers on, of Amiga before even Commodore acquired Amiga, he was on the side helping on the software side, create our favorite 16 bit computer, right? The Amiga. Some of the fun conversations that happened and i'm not going to spoil much i want you to go watch this when they post this but talked about some things like what if atari had owned amiga that's kind of interesting he told this story about joe pillow if you don't know who joe pillow is wait for the story on that one it's hilarious folks he also talks about the appearance of the guru meditation at a Peter Gabriel concert, which was kind of interesting. But one of the things that really I enjoyed was his talk about how he developed Workbench under pressure in a certain amount of time, spending so much time in his office to make it happen. Again, I don't want to give too much away. I want you to experience that presentation on your own. I had a chance to talk with him in the morning of on day two and spent some time just getting to know him. And he was, again, just so gracious to let this weird guy come up to him and start chatting with him. But two things that came out of that that I thought were interesting, too, that I'll, I will share with you. His favorite Amiga game, FA-18 Interceptor, which that doesn't surprise me because it was one of my favorites. And his favorite hardware was the Video Toaster. And then I asked a question, did any of the Amiga developers own any 8-bit computers? And RJ said he wasn't sure about everybody else, but he owned a Commodore 64 and an Atari. And, of course, he has ties to Atari as well with the, the development of the Lynx. There were purchases made. I made purchases. But, again, I'm not sharing them in this video. So make sure that you do all that stuff down below, as I mentioned earlier. But also, you go to buymeacoffee.com slash retrocombs and you can find out how to be a supporter of my channel when the day ended and it did end it was obvious jamie and i did not properly prepare because we didn't have a chance to get a lunch in there so we did go get an early dinner and we went and got the true canadian experience and went to a place called swiss chalet if you if you're Canadian, you know all about it. If you're an American coming in and a regular, you, you probably know about it. It's a little family restaurant. It's a chain of them. For me, they're famous for their chicken and their sauce. And then afterwards, I needed to do some shopping because the lovely accountant told me, Don't come home without ketchup chips. So I've got her all kinds of bags of ketchup flavored chips. Get them across the border, get them home. And she is set for the year on ketchup chips, I hope, for the year. If not, she's probably going to send me back up here. Okay, and that was it for day one. So... I guess we should talk about day two. All right, day two began with another light breakfast. Hotel breakfast is, uh, it was fine. It was cheap, it's inexpensive, and it's free. So they, well, free, man, it's added. But, you know, after breakfast, we had some time. So we decided to sit out by the fireplace downstairs and a couple of big old comfy chairs. And uh, I worked on some video. Uh, Jamie, I think, was catching up some on some reading and email. And then we headed back over to the show for an 11 o'clock presentation on a computer I had never heard of, the MCM70. And Cam Farnell came in and gave this presentation via Zoom. Now, let me say this. There were a handful of presentations that were made via Zoom. That's good about that is it did allow presenters who couldn't be there to actually Zoom in. But it's not the same experience. I will just say personal preferences. I enjoyed the folks who were there face-to-face -face more. And I will say that Cam's presentation was really interesting on this MCM70, which I never heard of. And I will put a link down in the video description, but it's a Canadian computer from the 1970s and considered to be the first personal computer. It was running an Intel 8008, running at 0.8 megahertz, and it used cassette drives for its storage. And it also had a single line screen. You think about this in the early 1970s, this really was ahead of its time. Fun fact about it was there was no power switch on this thing, but you could program it to power shut down in code. I thought that was just very fascinating. It's kind of Raspberry Pi-ish like. So after that presentation, it was back walking through the conference hall. This will be your next purchase. <laughs> He's already so, so Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then I had a chance to meet with Ranko over at the Mini MIG booth or exhibit. This exhibit is amazing. Ranko actually has 
a factory in his garage. I had a chance to talk with him, just get to know him. He showed me the mini make, showed me all the different variations of it. Uh, Chris was kind of helping to explain me how all this works. If you're not sure what the mini make is, there's a video over at Chris's channel where he talks all about the mini. It is a fabulous device, but hold that thought. I'll come back to that. So after walking around, we got a chance to go back into the presentation room and Leaf was presenting on the now, this is so cool. This is on tracking the ISS, the International Space Station, on a VIC-20 and a C-64. Now, what was fun about this is he talked about the entire process. So we got a whole history of networking, specifically TCP, IP. So right now, there are three or four different ways that you can get networking on a C-64. One of them is through the cartridge port. One of them is using the user port. Another one is through the IEC port. And there's different variations of all of that. So you're going to want to check out his presentation to find out what he used, something called Meatloaf. But I won't do that. Which is another presentation to get tracking of the ISS on the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64. Spoiler alert, Meatloaf is a version of FujiNet for the Commodore, and that's what he uses to parse JSON files so that he can track the ISS on screen on the 64 using sprites on the VIC-20 using characters. It's so cool. You got to check it out. He's a NASA engineer. He, he truly is like a rocket scientist. Now, Meatloaf, as I mentioned, was the underlying networking protocol that was used to track the ISS. And Jamie Adolpix, I think that's the way, I apologize, Jamie, if I butchered your name, also came in via Zoom and shared what Meatloaf is and how Meatloaf was created and what it is capable of doing and its connection to FujiNet. It's really interesting because this protocol actually works through the IEC. So you're networking through your IEC port. So it does slow it down because you're, you're basically at the same write speeds or read speeds as a floppy disk drive, a 1541 floppy disk. But he is working on implementing Jiffy DOS so it'll speed up that data transfer. So it's a little slow, but it's so cool because you can put in a URL and It'll attach online via the internet and download that .d64 image, that .tap image, .d81, whatever format is out, even a .prg, and it will grab it and through the internet, through the IEC, dump it on to the Commodore or the 64 or the VIC-20. It's really cool to see it in play. Now, here's the problem, though. He did try and do a live demo. Live demos, oof. Through those problems, though, he revealed some really cool things. For instance, he's using... Visual Studio Code to program in BASIC and then port that over to the Commodore. I need to figure out how to do that. I would really love to be able to create a Commodore 64 program in Visual Studio Code. And it did look like it had uh, the language support for it because it was uh, coding, color coding the language and giving suggestions. Uh, so I need to figure all that out. And then how do you easily get that program compiled and sent over to the Commodore? That that looks really cool. Something I want to check out. All right, we were late into the day. It was time for lunch and we needed something quick. So guess what? We went to, I know people are probably groaning right now, McDonald's. But you know what? Canadian McDonald's are different than American McDonald's. And one of the things I got was just a regular, you know, burger. Got a, a, a like a McDouble or whatever. It's just that little burger with some, you know, some onion pickles and mustard call it a day. But they had fries on the side, right? But it was poutine fries. You know, you get a little upcharge. You get the gravy and the cheese on top of the McDonald's fries. Very Canadian, uh, so I'm, I'm glad at least at the McDonald's we got some Canadian fries. So we got back in just in time to see the tail end of Dan Wood and David Pleasance. And Dan is, of course, a content creator. You've probably seen his channels. David was a sales manager for Commodore and Amiga in the UK. Now, again, I was late, so I missed a lot of it. So you're definitely going to want to go out and check this. But what I grabbed from it was the conversation of the Amiga community still being a thing in the 2020s. Also interesting was David mentioned that his belief that the Amiga lost the market was because Commodore refused to move forward. They were so intent on ensuring compatibility that they wouldn't let the computer go forward. I had never thought about it that way, but that kind of makes sense. And that's the way that Apple has continued to innovate and move forward. And then finally, RJ was there. It was really cool to see RJ and David connect. If if virtually, because David was on Zoom along with Dan, it was really fun to watch them interact with each other. You could tell there was still a strong kinsmanship there and a strong connection from their days with Amiga. And uh, they even had uh, talked a little bit about having just met a few months ago in Germany and spending time together. So just really cool. So check out 
that presentation when it's online. And then the last presentation, and I've already talked about Rank Erotic, was on the Mini MIG. And again, the Mini MIG uh, has been updated from version 1 to 1.7. It is a recreation of the Amiga computer. It is amazing. Check it out. He's got a case with it. He's got all these different boards, but he's coming out with a new version, which is uh, something I'm looking forward to. And it's called the Ami Cube. And the Ami Cube board, as of this filming, is three days old. I think they should have said, hey, we're going to reveal uh, something here like they would have done in an original world of Commodore, right? Ranko could have just kind of held this thing back until his presentation and said, by the way, I've got something special to share with you all today. Wow, an Amiga board released in 2023, a new one with these features. And the features on this thing are amazing. This is going to be a 68040 performance with 64 megabytes of SD RAM. It's going to be possibly using an Intel Cyclone 10 FPGA with Zorro boards and Zorro slots. Uh, I mean, it's pretty amazing. And he does all of this out of his garage. As a matter of fact, he has a pick and place machine and it's just amazing. He shared his uh, manufacturing process with us the way it is now. And I had a chance to talk with him as he was leaving, helped him carry some stuff back out. And uh, he's shooting for a board under $200. Uh, and then another one that'll be a little bit more and that'll provide the Zorro slots and some other support. But he's also looking to finally move his uh, manufacturing out of his garage to some um, storefront somewhere, or not storefront, but another location. Check out his site at www.minimig.ca. All right, that was my World of Commodore trip. That's a lot, I know, but I want to thank you for listening to that. Initial thoughts, again, I wasn't sure about this show. I wasn't sure if it was going to be something I was going to enjoy. I knew it was a smaller venue when I showed up the day before. I think Jamie worried that I was going to be disappointed in making the trip up here. I think he's, he was psyched about it, but it is definitely a different vibe than Vintage computer festival if you just want a conference that is commodore focused i think i saw a timex we saw a nabu but i mean this is commodore so if you are looking for like-minded commodore enthusiasts this is your conference i am glad i made the trip i'm um, not sure if i'll be able to make it two years in a row because this is the worst time of the year to have this you know the the first week in december back home is usually parades and ceremony and we're getting into the holidays and everybody's busy and we just came off Thanksgiving so it's tough to leave but I think it was worth it for me and the, I think the biggest takeaway for me was a chance again to meet RJ Michael you know I got the chance to talk with him and again all the other characters and developers everybody from the YouTube community it was so great to meet all of you there thanks for being so gracious and kind I didn't meet an unkind person there which is just amazing. That's why it was so good. Uh, that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed my little tale of the world of Commodore. It's pretty kind of, it's kind of linear. So apologies. You probably got bored along the way and may not have hung out this long, but if you did really appreciate it and hope you enjoyed it. If you have questions about any of it, put it down in the comments. That's it for me. Retro comes out. Don't forget, I'll be doing a live stream to reveal all the stuff I got at world of Commodore. So hit all that stuff down below so that you can find out when I reveal that. All right. Thanks everybody from Canada, from Canada, Toronto's right out there. Wow.